Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's November 12th, 2018, uh, and I could not be uh, more excited, as always, for today's interview. Um, today, we have assembled a distinguished panel um, of uh, Native Americans uh, who were raised Mormon, and uh, we are here uh, to talk about their experiences. Now, some of you are going to be familiar with the Losing the Lamanite series uh, that we that we did on Mormon Stories podcast uh, a year or two ago, where we had several people that uh, would have been characterized as Lamanites uh, talk about uh, their experiences and their stories. Um, today, we're going to be taking a slightly different angle. Uh, today, we're going to be um, uh, featuring a book uh, that came out in the past few months. The book is called Decolonizing Mormonism. Uh, it is edited by Gina Colvin, Dr. Gina Colvin, who runs the Thoughtful Faith podcast here for the Open Stories Foundation, and Joanna Brooks, uh, who was one of the original uh, chairmen of the board of directors of the Open Stories Foundation uh, back in 2011, 2012. They put together uh, a really important, interesting book uh, called Decolonizing Mormonism. And in that, uh, in that really amazing book, in chapter three, uh, is an essay by Angelo Baca, who uh, is returning to Mormon Stories podcast. We had him previously on Mormon Stories with uh, Thomas Murphy to talk about the Bears Ears Monument. Um, Angelo Baca, I think I should say Dr. Angelo Baca. Is that right, Angelo? Uh, not quite yet. Um, okay, you're working on your PhD. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Well, you wrote, Angela wrote an amazing article called Porter Rockwell and Samuel the Lamanite Fist Fight in Heaven. And this is basically uh, one Native American's perspective, uh, you know, who was raised Mormon on uh, the decolonizing of Mormonism, or if we want to say it in a different way, uh, the colonization uh, of Native Americans uh, within the Mormon context. So uh, today we are going to have uh, Angelo Baca on and four uh, distinguished panelists, two of whom are re returning to Mormon Stories podcast and uh, two who are brand new to Mormon Stories podcast. So why don't we be begin by going kind of around the, the panel and have everyone just kind of give a brief introduction. And we'll start with you, Angelo. And let me unmute you because you're, you're muted. muted. There you go. Oh, there we are. There we are. Okay. okay. Uh, sure. So, Yat uh, Angelo Baca Yinishia. Hello, my name is Angelo Baca. Uh, so, um, I introduced myself in my clans. I'm Navajo and Hopi. Uh, that's how we introduce ourselves as clan wise to uh, figure out who our relations are and uh, who is connected to us in our communities. Um, so in a traditional way, that's how I introduce myself. And I still, I still do that. Um, it is kind of part of that decolonizing process. Um, I feel like those are the most important qualifications, not the, not the letters behind the name. Uh, so I think for me, this has been, um, a journey, um, that's been both personal and professional. I did this research in my master's at the university of Washington um, doing a film uh, called, um, in layman's terms, looking at Lamanite identity, which had me going across the country and asking about what is a Lamanite and um, having that be my master's thesis film. And now I'm in a PhD program at NYU in the Department of Anthropology. And I did a film recently about um, Bears Ears National Monument called Shashjat Bears Ears. And that's being shown all over the world in film festivals. And it gives the perspective of the indigenous grassroots folks and how they uh, petitioned for the monument to actually uh, become a success during the Ad Obama administration. And I think all of these um, have deep ties to both Utah and Mormonism. So they are not separate from each other. They each informs the other. And uh, it's still part of my ongoing work to address many of these issues. And I believe this movie is being shown tonight uh, on PBS in Utah. Is that right? Oh, I think that's the Battle Over Bears Ears film. Oh, uh, that's different than yours. Okay, you yeah, consulted the, on that film. That's the KUED uh, production that the University of Utah uh, helped to produce. But I'm working with them to find out if we can do a, a, 
a dual um, screening of my film and their film on December 4th in Salt Lake City on the anniversary of Trump's announcement um, to reduce the, the monument. So hopefully we'll gather a lot of people into the, uh, uh, the educational informative space. They can see both of these films of how the monument came to be and then everything that's happened since then, which I think the other documentary does a good job covering. Excellent. Well, it's a pleasure to have you back on Mormon Stories Podcast, Angelo. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right. I want to reintroduce uh, Sarah Newcomb. Sarah is the reason why we're having this interview. She coordinated it um, and she's uh, returning to Mormon Stories Podcast. Sarah, uh, welcome back to Mormon Stories. Thank you. It's great to have you. Tell us, tell us, tell us, those of us who don't remember your interview, tell us a little bit about yourself, if you don't mind. Um, I am Simsian of the First Nations Eagle Clan. Um, it is a matriarchal society, and the Eagle Clan in our society is passed down matriarchal, matriarchal and is a family identity also. Um, I did, I've uh, done the LamanitTruth.com website where I talk about different historical issues within Mormonism and how it relates to Lamanites. Um, and I did, yeah, one of the Losing the Lamanites episodes. One of the things that kind of hit home that um, Angelo already said was just some of the ways that he's, how he identifies himself is one of the ways that helps him connect. And that's something that's been true in my case too. Um, we have a saying in in Simpsian that's apaga nalipulishim, which means remembering our own. And that's definitely been a journey of reconnecting with language and history and and remembering where I come from. So I love it. Well Sarah, it's a it's a pleasure to have you back on Mormon Stories podcast. Uh, Hiram Joe, uh, welcome back and give us a quick introduction. Welcome back to Mormon Stories Podcast. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Happy to be back, John. <laughs> uh, Hiram Joe. Uh, my first clan is Nato Dene, uh, tobacco people and reading, red running into water uh, uh, people, and uh, born for the Ute clan. That's my father's side. We got a, got a little bit of mixture there, uh, Navajo and Ute. Um, I uh, did a podcast a couple of years ago. It was, was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And um, I just want to say that I'm happy to be with the rest of you uh, fine people. And I'm um, looking forward to good discussion, good talks. And um, uh, hopefully we can <laughs> gun up a lot of people for this, for this uh, interview and podcast. So um, just happy to be here. All right. Thanks, Hiram. Cam. Uh, Cam, Cam and I have known each other for several years now. Uh, but this is the first time Cam uh, Levin has appeared on Mormon Stories podcast. So, Cam, tell us a bit about yourself. Hey, yeah, my name is Cam Levin. Uh, I really appreciate you doing this, John. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to mention that uh, it is Native American Heritage Month this month, and that's why I was, I was really excited to be able to do be a part of this podcast. Um, I was actually born in Page, Arizona. My father is Hiligana or, or white, and my mother is, is Navajo or Diné. And we actually, we, I, I, I try and say Dene. I don't usually use the white man term for our name, uh, Navajo. So I, that's what I try and uh, use as well. Uh, but I, I grew up in, in a small town in Utah, uh, Delta, Utah. So I was, I was raised with, with um, uh, white traditions and really lost a lot of my native traditions. Would go back once a year, but um, we really didn't know. Uh, about the Navajo traditions and, and was and felt out of place as well as, you know, being in Utah, I felt out of, out of place with, with, uh, with my color and only being the only native family in the, in the city was, it was really tough. So I really had some, some tough, um, times trying to just learn which, where I fit in, uh, for to this, to this world. And so, and I can speak a little bit more to that as, as we go on, but I went on a mission to Columbia when I turned, um, 19, of course, and, and came back, I got married in the temple and lived, lived a Mormon life until I was about 38 years old when I uh, found Mormon stories and um, a lot of other podcasts and a lot of books that, that really taught me what I, what I hadn't learned all my life and helped me to, uh, you know, 
move, move out of the Mormon life and actually start finding my, my traditional life a little, a little more. And so I've kind of grasped onto the native ways rather than uh, actually living a Mormon life. And you've invited me to come hang out with you uh, and it's participate. Amazing. Yeah, well, you're going to do a sweat with us one of these times in, uh, in camera. If I'm uh, if I'm welcome, I'd, it'd be an honor. So thank you. All right. Well, Sheldon, uh, would would you mind uh, introducing yourself to us as another new guest on Mormon Stories podcast? Yeah. Thank you for having me on, John. It's nice to meet you. Um, listen, listen to you a couple of times. Uh, my name is Sheldon Spotted Elk. I'm Northern Cheyenne. We're the tribe that uh, killed Custer. Us in the in the Sioux and the Rapos, we killed Custer. That's our gift to humanity. So you guys are welcome. <laughs> Um, but also, I, so I originally from Montana, but I grew up most of my life in, in San Juan County, Utah, in Blandy, Utah, um, where my mom is, is she's white and she's, um, Mormon heritage all the way back to the founding of the church. Um, and very proud of that, that Mormon heritage, um, a, a bell map that came across the plains. Um, and then my, my father, uh, traditionally Cheyenne grew up traditionally participated in all our ceremonies um and met, met my mom and had six kids and we, we grew up at i think their marriage might have been the the story of the flying fish and the swooping crane they never were able to really occupy each other's environment because um, we tried to live on reservations we tried to live off reservations but this border town blandy utah ended up being the place where where if you could walk out my front door you could see the bear's ears on the on the sunset horizon actually uh where i grew up and so that's that's and, and that ends up being like one of the most uh, racist uh, towns when it comes to white Indian relations and, and some of the hypocrisy that you can see within Mormonism and in this Lamanite narrative um, this de that we're degenerates, you know, that we're degenerate Jews, you know, that this narrative that Mormonism, the central premise of Mormonism, if you, some would say. Um, but that's where I grew up. I'm a lawyer by training. Um, I, I do a lot of work with tribes. I, I Used to represent kids in, in foster care and juvenile delinquency, but but now I, I, I do some national work and, and get around quite a bit um, in Indian country. I haven't actually been to uh, inside of a Mormon church for about 10 years either, so, so it's been a long time, uh, but I did go on a Mormon mission. Um, I went to Chicago um, in 2000 to 2002, so I, I, I did the whole two years. And for that reason, I know I could, I could do anything for two years doesn't matter. I can do anything in this world. I can go to prison for two years. I, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, Sheldon. Welcome to all of you. Um, again, uh, today, if I had to give an overview of what this what today's session is going to be about, well, we're, we're basically going to be talking about colonization. Uh, we're going to give a brief overview of the colonization of Native Americans in the United States, kind of take it, take it up to the early 1800s, what would have been the social or cultural context that Joseph Smith, uh, you know, would have grown up in, how that would have naturally kind of led to uh, the creation of a book like the Book of Mormon and uh, the the myths and the legends and the, around, you know, and the creation of the the Lamanite identity. Um, and then we're going to talk about the legacy of that uh, Lamanite identity um, from the standpoint of of kind of Mormon colonization. And we're going to be discussing several of the tools uh, or the negative outcomes of, you know, the, the Mormon colonization of Native Americans. Um, Angela is going to kind of lead us through that. But we're going to have the other participants, again, add a color and perspective. I just want to read a couple things, Angelo, from this wonderful essay. Again, the book is uh, Decolonizing Mormonism. Uh, approaching a post-colonial Zion, edited by Dr. Gina Colvin and Dr. Joanna Brooks. Uh, the the essay is entitled "Porter Rockwell and Samuel the Lamanite Fistfight in Heaven." Uh, the subtitle is "A Mormon Navajo Filmmaker's Perspective." It's a wonderful essay. I highly recommend this book. I hope you all will buy it and support Gina and uh, Joanna and all the authors. But there are a couple things I want to start with, um, Angelo. As a filmmaker, uh, you mentioned in, in this book the importance of stories and oral traditions and storytelling, which I obviously resonates with me on Mormon Stories podcast. But you write, film for me is closely aligned with storytelling. 
in indigenous tradition. American culture doesn't understand the high value indigenous people place on our oral traditions, storytellers, and song keepers. You go on to write, this is the primary mode of decolonizing our own stories, the opposite of the colonizing nature of Mormon co-optation and appropriation of our histories in the Book of Mormon. And that's kind of where we want to begin. This is giving each of you a chance to tell Mormons a new Native American Mormon story and hopefully to claim back some of the power of your own narrative. Um, so I thought, Angela, it might be good to begin with, and I know this is going to do it a grave injustice, but kind of a brief history of Native American colonization and the background that listeners would need to know uh, to then understand the context of Joseph Smith and the creation of the Book of Mormon. But before we dive in, do you want to do any framing or setup to this conversation so that it goes aligned with your desires and preferences and and sensitivities? Um, not really. I mean, just to say that I do I do put a lot of uh, emphasis on storytelling because that's really where I come from. Uh, my grandfather was a traditional storyteller in the community and um, it actually kind of dawned on me one day that I'm sort of doing the same thing that he did. I just use film to do it. So I'm sharing people's stories. Um, I'm also, you know, trying to document oral traditions, history, culture, language, uh, keep that and preserve that for our future generations, mostly for our community, because that's, that's who it belongs to. Um, and I'm also do work in terms of talking about traditional and indigenous intellectual property. And I know that's kind of a fairly new emerging field because, um, you know, historically, the archives uh, favor non-Indigenous people, and they've co-opted our stories, they've taken them, they've had them, um, you know, uh, documented and given different names, uh, other authors, other people get credited for our stories or our images or even our medicines. So there's lots of these different issues of talking about why um, certain things are the way that they are in the world that we occupy and how these lived realities have multiple layered meanings. Um, it's kind of the reason why um, I sort of gave this a cheeky title, right? It's like the the play on the title of um, Samuel the Lamanite um, and, and Porter Rockwell is basically uh, from uh, Sherman Alexie's title about the Lone Ranger and Tonto fistfight in heaven, um, because from that artistic perspective, you can see that these are two key figures in pop culture, and yet they're thrown for, for, our, for our millennials out there, yeah. tell our millennials who uh, Lone <laughs> Ranger and Tonto were and what was kind of wrong with that representation so they understand the reference. I don't even know where to start with that. Um, <laughs> the Lone Ranger and Tonto did a terrible job as much as the book. It was a TV Marvel. show in what, the 50s? Yeah, it, it it was from black and white times. It basically pitted this uh, um, white law enforcement ranger um, as the leader of these these two, this duo. And Tonto was this uh, Indian sidekick who was basically reduced to, you know, just some Indian speak and grunts and groans to really emphasize that uncivilized characteristic of the the savage nature of indigenous peoples. Um, so I really kind of think it's quite fitting, actually, if you really think about how ridiculous it is, it's, you need one to, to support the other. There is no hierarchy and there is no leader or dominance of another unless there's allowed to have an opposite. So they illustrated both the apex and the lowest level of civilization. And I think that's the same thing that happens here in terms of the Book of Mormon, uh, using indigenous peoples as Lamanites, it gives us a real subhuman position. Um, and that's, you know, it's important for us to recognize the power of story. For native peoples, this is key to our creation stories or oral traditions. Some of these stories have so much power that you can only tell them at certain times of the year. So like right now we're, we're moving into that phase of winter when you tell some of the most sacred stories 
that give you an insight into the world that are packed with cultural traditions, with lessons, with uh, history, and they give you um, many different cultural and spiritual insights. And I think that, you know, it's important for us to go back to those traditional stories and to know why those are important. Um, because, you know, when I was growing up, the church had this huge influence of don't learn those traditions, don't learn those lessons, because those are the lessons of your ancestors. We have the truth. We have the real story. And you should listen to us. And I thought there was something fundamentally wrong with that from the very beginning. I just didn't know how to put my finger on it or articulate it very well. So hopefully, you know, trying to write that into the story, it will flip a switch on into other people's minds when they read it, if they also have similar questions. Because I'm really emphasizing the need for people to think and intellectualize their positionality in all of these traditions and stories and to, you know, understand where their hearts and their minds have to find a balance. Um, some people do that very well. Some people are both traditional and also Mormon. Uh, some people reject it outright, or some people kind of go back and forth. You know, uh, there's a story that when I was over at the Hill Camora, you know, a uh, guy we were interviewing said his aunt, she tried on several religions like they were outfits. <laughs> You know, and I think this is, it's telling, it's really interesting for um, talking about religion and native peoples. We've always been accepting of many people's faiths. We's, we've always been tolerant and inclusive and, you know, um, supportive of community and peacemaking processes. And I think if anything is untrue, it's that, you know, that we're filthy, that we're wicked, that we're savage. Um, it's quite the opposite. We're the ones that have been extremely tolerant, inclusive, and loving to many different backgrounds, cultures, people. Thank you. That's a great introduction. Um, Angela, if it's okay, uh, and this is really hard to do, but let's just say you're talking to some high schoolers or, or college students that haven't really had a decent American history course, and they have just a general understanding of American history and Columbus and, you know, the, the, um, you know, 17th and 18th, 19th century, Western America. Um, if you were to give them an overview of the colonization of, of Native Americans, you know, how, what, what would that overview sound like? What, what would, how would you begin the story? How would you tell the story? Well, I think that there are, there are lots of places to start that story. Um, but the, I think the challenge is that you have to meet people no matter who they are, even if they're high schoolers or even if they're professors, you have to meet them halfway and you have to figure out where are they in terms of knowing what the actual histories are and the facts, the data, the information that they can utilize to come to an understanding in a more comprehensive way. And um, I've been finding, because I've been doing both of those in these spaces, that it generally is almost nothing. They almost have no background and you kind of do have to start from zero. Um, and so the best way that I found to talk to people about it is to really um, think about things in a way that isn't just lineal, you know, just like here's the calendar, here's, you know, um, how these uh, centuries have piled up and here's where we are stacked in, into history. Um, there is no better example, I think, of a place that collapses the, the past, the present, and the future than Bears Ears, because uh, it, it has all of that. It has the petroglyphs, the rock art, ancestral sites, um, the medicines that we still use, you know, the, the animals that we're still hunting, the wood that we still are using today to keep us warm. And then the future aspirations of this place, how it has medicine to protect and keep us all healthy and safe. And those things I think are a way to start having those conversations because you're talking to people who in the dominant culture are socialized and conditioned to think in linear ways. They're thinking very straight on, very rigid and square box ways. 
Indigenous peoples don't think like that. We think in cycles and circles and a comprehensive whole. We're thinking about the part on this side, but then the part on the other side. And we know that nothing is separate. They're all connected and they're part of one thing. And I think that's a really important thing to understand and put your finger on, locate it early with whoever you're talking to, because otherwise you can say anything that you want, they're just not going to get it because you haven't started from that place where you're both at the same spot to, to understand each other's perspectives. Makes sense. Um, yeah. So, so again, it depends on who you're talking to, right? It's like students. Okay. Well, you know, let's tear down all the stuff about Columbus day, tear down all the stuff about what they know with the pilgrims and Thanksgiving, tear down all the stuff that they know about, you know, food and, you know, where these, um, these recipes and these uh, people who claim certain, um, you know, uh, heritages uh, along these lines that have become popular in our culture. We go all the way back to the beginning. We, sh we show them this great civilization that we had. We had cities, we had medicine, astronomy, agriculture. We had mathematics. We had, um, you know, a complicated, very um, intricate ways of knowing the world and had our own ways of documenting these things, whether they be on the wall or they be on scrolls, they were still part and parcel of that entire lived reality that we all shared here in the world. And those I think have to be, they have to start simply and first, everything that people know identified got to go right to both the heart and the mind. So just understanding that we have family, we have relatives and those plants and those animals, those are our relatives too. This river, that mountain, these rocks, these trees, those are our relatives too. Uh, and I, I agree with, uh, you know, with what Hiram's saying is like, you know, Diné, it's like, that's the people, you know, it means the people. It basically means a human being. We would say Diné Be'eshkla, which is the five-fingered people. Five-fingered people real, really is the only difference between us and the other people. We have five fingers, we have the little opposable thumb. If we're going to talk from the anthropological perspective, we're the only ones that can utilize this for a lot of tool making, right? And that is really a huge marker. And that's about it. We're not any better. We're not any worse. We're all part of a larger family. And those are our relatives and they need to be taken care of too. So for us as human beings, we'll, we'll identify ourselves as that too. So this is a, a really important perspective shift, even at the beginning before you have those conversations, because those other folks who don't come from those backgrounds or teachings, they're not going to understand that right away. Such a beautiful heritage, something to be so proud of. And it's just so beautiful to listen to. Thank you, Angelo. Um, Sarah, do you want do do you want to add anything just as an introduction, sort of to what Angelo said? Yeah, I have I have a couple comments. Um, one, I think I shared it in one of the podcasts I helped with, but what he just finished with one of my favorite quotes is Chief Seattle's um, of I'm probably going to get part of it wrong here, but uh, humans have not created the web of life, but are one thread within it. Everything is, uh, or whatever we do to each other, we do to ourselves. Everything is connected. Everything is bound together. And that's, and everything being all life. Um, and that's definitely something that I've connected with just naturally um, as I've reclaimed my own identity. But I do see such a difference in how I believe versus um, where I came from and having some of the conversations that I've had with people from different backgrounds that there's that, that difference of thinking does create a challenge. Um, the one thing I was going to add too was earlier this year, I had the opportunity to talk to a, you know, 19, 20 year old right in there, um, missionary who told me that native Americans didn't have religion when Columbus came and uh, that's why the restoration was so important. Um, and so 
hearing her say that surprised me because obviously we are very religious people, but it helped me realize that that colonization of of religion, which has been a huge part from the very beginning. And I think understanding that the people that came and colonized were extremely religious and viewed their religion as how they how they thought. The it it formed it formed their viewpoint of everything that they had to deal with in life, how they saw other people. Um, and that was one of the challenges I think that was a massive challenge in in the very beginning of colonization is not understanding our our religions and our our uh, way of life, way of thinking, connection to everything um, was demonized or talked down to instead of embraced or understood. Thank you. No, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think in westward expansion and in the colonization or, uh, you know, of the Native Americans and in, and in, you know, the migrations of, of people from Western Europe over to North America and Central and South America, it was all about land and resources and, and building their civilizations. And I don't think it, I don't think they spent a lot of time trying to be empathetic or understanding of the cultures they were displacing. And, uh, no, and the, the drive to get resources and expand in that sense, religion was used as a tool against the Native Americans and the indigenous people everywhere to say, well, you know, you're not righteous enough. Um, within Mormonism, that was, honestly, that was one of my biggest struggles. Um, I've still carried a lot of <laughs> shame over this. This was one of my things that I had to get past. I know when we did my first interview, um, I talked a lot about skin color and not being able to dance or embrace cultural traditions um, as part of my colonized experience. And at the end of the interview, you asked me about heritage and how that affected me. And um, at the time, all I could think is, well, my, I'm proud of my Simpson heritage now. So I, I couldn't give you a clear answer because I was in a place of being proud of it. But what I realized is my Lamanite heritage, which is how I identified before I lost my, you know, once I found my way out of Mormonism, my Lamanite heritage affected me even more greatly. And this, this is kind of ties into how America was colonized is the book of Mormon warns the Lamanites that if they don't embrace religion, and do what they're supposed to do, they're going to lose their lands and be destroyed. And so growing up, having conversations with my family as I'd learn more about history, and I was, I was getting into Native American history um, and hearing about different wars and massacres were always kind of traumatic. And I'd say, well, why did God let that happen? What, how could this happen? And of course, I would have those lessons that tied it into the Book of Mormon. And so <laughs> I, I have this shame over how could I write off Native American and indigenous deaths as something that was supposed to happen, as something that God allowed or commanded to happen in a way, um, because they weren't righteous, they lost their lands, because they weren't righteous the lands were given away. Even the song, uh, Book of Mormon Stories, the children's song, talks about how the land welcomed all those who wanted to be free. It was, um, and there's a number of lessons that I've read. There's um, talks that I've read that address this issue of the Book of Mormon states, if the Lamanites aren't righteous, their land's going to be given away. They're going to lose their land and they're going to be destroyed. And so seeing that, having that be something God wanted definitely affected me. Instead of it being, this is history, you know, humans do things and approaching it from a more intellectual standpoint, it tied God into it. And I think that's a tad nefarious too, but it it's how 
America, you know, was colonized was through this same process of using religion as a reason to take the land. Thank you, Sarah. I, I want to get the other panelists in, but but Angelo, it, are you comfortable just giving us a little bit of a, let's just say that the, the common narrative that most Mormons hear is that, that you know, Native Americans are, are the descendants of Lehi and Nephi who came over on a boat uh, 600 years before Christ. Um, maybe there were some other small groups here. Um, but but basically, the Native Americans that ended up bumping into uh, or being dominated by, you know, kind of westward, you know, Western European expansion in the nineteen in the eighteen nineteen hundreds, etc. Um, you know, Joseph Smith would have would have been bumping into or or on the frontier, exposed to Native Americans, um, and you know. You know, we all know from the Book of Mormon narrative that that uh, that there was a light and dark skinned group over time that God cursed the the bad the bad ones with dark skin so that they'd be dark and loathsome. Uh, you know, to the lighter skinned Nephites, and eventually the the light skinned um, Native Americans were killed off by the dark skinned ones, and and that's who Joseph Smith and others in the 1800s would have been seeing you know that's just a really brief version of you know what what most mormons would think of with the native americans and that because of their wickedness they fell into savagery and and um uncivilized behaviors and you referenced that a bit um and and so angelo if you were to if you were to tell maybe a high level different narrative um that would lead us up to why Joseph Smith would even be thinking about Native Americans and why he would attempt to write a book about Native Americans. Can you can you paint us maybe a story that you would be more comfortable with in terms of what led to uh, the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith's teachings about the Lamanites? Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, and first, you know, thank you, Sarah, also for sharing. I know that's really always tough to share those personal parts of you. I know that uh, it took me a long time to even write those words down and then have that be included in the book. Um, there's this great article that um, I always think about, too, about the anxieties of authorship and it's because precisely that book, the Book of Mormon existed and that Joseph Smith made up this entire story that I do have a lot of anxiety towards people who just write these things as if they're truth. And then they take them literally as truth. And that has real consequences and can do real damage, violence, harm to people. And I think that there's no better evidence of that than the Book of Mormon. You know, I'm always curious to think what other people in the world think about Lamanites. Like, I know the, the church's efforts to convert people are pretty steady, and, and um, you know, they're going full tilt over there in Africa. They've pretty much given, you know, up on Latin America because they've already done as much as they can in terms of pushing indigenous narratives against the wall with their own narrative about what a Lamanite is. And it just makes me think, why aren't they asking those questions? Why aren't they questioning their own indigeneity? Why aren't they talking about why uh, Native Americans and their own culture are being appropriated and see how that they are also being utilized in this larger machine to justify many of the acts that have been done historically and contemporarily by using this narrative. And I think this is really something that it bothers me so much that, um, you know, it, 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 it makes me think about the power of story. And it's not just in getting information right, which that's a super important, but it's who's telling the story. You know, it's, it's not the, it's not the river. It's the source of it, right? The source of its mouth. And you have to think about why did Joseph Smith take these ideas, appropriate them, use them for his own. And the answers are really simple. Once you look at it, he was a grave robber. 
He stole things out of, you know, dead people's graves. He was convicted of these kinds of acts over and over again. There's court records of it. Um, he was close to the Seneca and the Haudenosaunee countries. He knew about their culture. He knew about um, the, some of the things that they did, the kind of spiritual and cultural traditions that they had. Having that direct connection to God, the one-to-one -one that you would have as a person to the creator and not having to go through some kind of hierarchy where it would be like, you know, the Pope or other priests or some pastor or something that you could directly connect to God. And there was all these things that talking about um, how these traditions were informing the conditions of the people in those places. And he would just start to utilize all of these large claims that he had no proof of that sounded grand and sweeping because it was different. It was super different than anything else that existed in his town of Palmyra, Palmyra or New York, or even in any of the, uh, the other states of, the, of America at that time. So it was, in a way, very attractive because in people's minds, it also it was different, but it filled in a void about how did those American Indians get here? How did those indigenous peoples get here? Because we were told in the Bible it was Adam and Eve. And then we were told later that, you know, these migrations that were in the Bible are the truth. And so our literal existence, our physical embodiment of being present in the land was confusing and strange to these newcomers. And you have to remember many of the people who came over to this country, they were already seeking refuge and asylum from their other countries because they were borderline religious fanatics. And they were doing this stuff on a regular basis and making it normal. And, and that's why it's really important to know the difference because this country is so young. They haven't figured it out. The direction that they were headed in was incorrect. And it's the same in so many other human and, uh, you know, uh, communities that people displace people, displace other people, colonize people, colonize other people. And that is really the fundamental root of how the country got started. Because once they started doing that to us and they had westward expansion, manifest destiny, they were heading this way. The Mormons started to do that to indigenous peoples too. They claim to be, you know, uh, marginalized, to be oppressed, but they were doing that to us too. And I failed to see where they have any justification in doing those actions or making these claims. Um, they actually have to see all the way back to the beginning, even before they got here, about what the truth actually is of indigenous peoples. What, what, just give people a sense for how Native Americans were treated. I, I know that someone who's done a little bit of studying of history will know that it is quite um, astounding and horrific, but can you give people a sense for what was going on in the 15, 16, 17, 1800s as the as the Western Europeans started colonizing North, South, and Central America, what happened? What did they do? Uh, so this is kind of just the standard um, the 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 reason why people came out here into the early Americas into these indigenous spaces was because they they wanted land, they wanted money. Uh, they were looking for precious minerals. Um, anything that would make them rich or give them, um, you know, a, a lands that they could own. Um, and, I, and I think this has still been carried over um, into our modern way of thinking. We've really appropriated ownership and, you know, market capitalism as the way that we think things should be. But, you know, if you think about even all the way back to um, one of the early theorists about ownership, John Locke, he said, in the beginning, all, all the world was America. And that's, that's a quote, direct quote from him, meaning that he was thinking that all the world was basically virgin land to be conquered and owned, to be cultivated and to be made property. And this is the mindset back then, and it's still the mindset now. So a lot of horrible things were done. Slavery, massacres, genocide, disease, warfare, famine, displacement, removal, internment. And a lot of these things can still be seen. The effects of all that historical trauma, 
the recovery of our generations, the injury that's been done to our elders, to our traditional knowledge holders and our sacred spaces. Even from the first week that people got here to these shores here on the East Coast of the United States, they began grave robbing and they haven't stopped. And you know, we've had to produce these new ways and these new cultural ceremonies and processes for things that had never been done before because no one ever robbed the dead. No one ever dug them up. No one ever had to bring them back home. So these are things that we're still dealing with. And I think you know, um, it would behoove a lot of Mormon followers and folks of the church to understand those atrocities of history and would give them a better idea of why we feel the way that we do and why their versions of history trying to overshadow or appropriate our own are detrimental and very damaging. Um, I'd like to hear from some of the other panelists, John, what do they think? Let's do it. Um, uh, Hiram, why don't you jump in? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, wow, I, I'm super excited about uh, uh, what has been discussed so far from Angelo and um, Sarah. Good things. I'm, I'm pretty much on the same page as, as you guys. Um, Gosh, as far as far as uh, you know, the colonization, um, you, you know, to go back in history, I'm glad to hear some of that uh, coming from Angelo. Um, I mean, you know, just to give you an example, uh, I don't think it was until 1924 that Congress um, gave citizenship to the Native Americans, <laughs> you know, as indigenous people. Like that's just another example. Um, and then in 1954, I believe that's that's when some states actually um, allowed, you know some of us to vote, um, you know, you have that time period in history. And, uh, you know, for me that the whole idea, the Western kind of rhetoric, you know, as far as using the terms, you know, uh, Native Americans being um, savages and uh, murderers and thieves and beggars. I mean, you know, you, you can't help but parallel those derogatory terms with the ones in the Book of Mormon, <laughs> you know, where we're, we're dark and filthy and lonesome and bloodthirsty those type of things and you know again i mean that's that, it's hurtful but as a member of the church um you know you, you have to you just kind of have to sweep that under the rug if it hurt you uh and just kind of go along with you know what's being taught at church what's being spoken in, in general conference um and and just kind of hide your pain and you suffer in silence and i think you know we've all had to go through that and you know that's that's what we felt for the longest time uh, but, you know, a bishop being non-white, he's going to be non-white. A stake president is going to be non-white. The eldest corn president is going to not, you know, he's going to be, I'm sorry, non-native. That's, that's what I'm going to say, not non-white. Non-native. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, we have the, the corn of 12 apostles, and then we have the first presidency. I mean, when's the last time uh, a, a brown guy has been in the first presidency? So there's going to be no understanding of what we are going through. I mean, even if we wanted to, you know, visit with a with a leader in the church and say, "Hey, I don't like these terms," which I've done several more than several times, there's just going to be no no validation. It, you know, I, I've had a, a bishop um, come in and had me mark out those derogatory terms. Uh, he had me mark out in the Book of Mormon um, white and delightsome, and and he had me change that to pure and delightsome. You know, those type of things. It, you know, and when it comes down to it, I just don't think they they don't want to recognize that it's hurtful, um, it, it, right? Because if, if they were uh, to agree with us or in a sense have, sympathize and empathize with, with us Native Americans when we have these issues, then, then the church starts to not become so true anymore. Um, it, you know, those, those things in the book that are said, they, they can't deny. I mean, th that's the scripture that comes from God. But for us, it, it hurts. And so it, does, it doesn't affect, you know, the leaders of the church. And, you know, that's one thing I wanted to bring up. But, um, you know, I, just for an example, you know, I mean, I have, I have a little bit more to say about the Indian placement program um, whenever you're ready for that. Um, Absolutely. We'll definitely get to in, that. In my, um, in my hometown, there was a, uh, a branch, a part of our state here called the Alma branch. And um, it, it was a, a Navajo speaking branch at the time. This was between... 1980 roughly to about 1985 and um it, you know it, it was a it was a branch that i never attended 
Um, but my father certainly had a, a part of that. He, he attended there, had a grandmother who went probably full time. Um, and, and basically, it would be the same as a, as a Spanish breaking branch today. Um, and when Spencer W. Kimball had passed on, um, I, I believe Ezra Tapp Benson kind of, you know, came down or, or sent representatives down here in this, in this area and kind of just aborted that whole, you know, idea of having an Alma branch for the Navajo people. And I believe it was the same year they they kind of, you know, got rid of the term uh, Lamanite generation and, you know, that turned into uh, Living Legends, I believe is what it was. I don't know if that's still going on at BYU. But um, it, it just, it kind of seemed like, you know, Ezra Tapp Benson, I know he's related to you, John. So no, no uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to do any um, hurt for that. But yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I believe he was kind of the one that took away that whole, you know, it, it felt like at that time we were maybe starting to blossom as a rose, as you know, the promise says in Jacob. Um, and that the Lamanites were being validated, like, hey, we have this, this branch, you know, for us, for our people. You know, we have, we have this, this organization at BYU. This is for our people. And so, you know, it kind of goes along with the lines of, hey, you know what, maybe we are special. Maybe what our leaders are telling us at church, it really is kind of come to fruition. And, and it, it, you know, it, it kind of did. It made the people in this area feel like, hey, maybe God is recognizing us through his, his prophet. Um, but they did away with all that, and Navajos became inactive. They they stopped believing in the church, um, and uh, you know I just for me you know that's just an example of of you know some of the things that happened. And and so I, I went online. I, I googled the Alma Branch in Kirtland, New Mexico, where I grew up, and there's nothing you can't find a thing on it. There's no history. There's nothing recorded. Um, and uh, talking with my dad the other day about it, he says it's it's just something that this town does not speak of. <laughs> uh, no, nobody wants to bring that up. Kind of like, you know, the, the priesthood band with the blacks and the priesthood, that type of thing. It's just not going to be spoken of. So then again, it's like, well, you can't, you can't just, I mean, this is something that people have questions about. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just, they just want to sweep it under the rug type of thing. And that still hurts. That still hurts a little bit. But um, anyway, I just wanted to bring that, that segment up. Thank you. Um to reflect what you said, Angelo, uh, when you were referring to Sarah's comments, it is a deeply personal thing to be sharing these sorts of stories. Uh, they're very emotional. They're very traumatic. They're very personal. And so for all of you, I want to reflect Angelo's um, sensitivities and say thank you for being willing to share such personal things. Um, thank you. Does anybody have a sense... Uh, of a number of just how many Native Americans have been estimated to have been sort of killed in the colonization efforts or who have died, let's just say prematurely, in the colonization efforts that happened from whatever, 1500 to 1900 or 2000. Does anybody, has anybody, has a scholar or an academic ever tried to come up with a number? Those numbers are hard to come up with because Nobody really knows how many people died prior to uh, many colonies actually being well established. Earlier points of contact with scouting parties, people who are looking for places to build their plantations and all of that, uh, they brought disease and thousands of people, even estimated of between one and two million from the tip of Cape Cod all the way down to Washington, D.C., died uh, before people even came in mass to the shores. And so there are still great stories handed down from generation to generation of that uh, great um, time of suffering. And uh, a lot of people didn't know what to do. There was no cure for some of those diseases that wiped out a large portion of the, um, the leadership. And you have to understand it's not just the leadership that collapses. It's the social structures, the family structures, the community structures, so what you basically have in the aftermath of, of those epidemics that burn through communities are um, chaos. You have chaos and you have disorganization, you have <clears throat> desperation um, and a lot of sadness and grief. And so when you're faced with those choices, which are very limited, you do have to make decisions. And when people come in mass, especially when they're affiliated with churches or missions, or they're trying to do conversion tactics on you, 
those choices look better and better than the lived realities that you face. And that's not just in the early times of indigenous uh, communities in contact with those folks here on these shores, but that's, that's from Central all the way down to South America. Some of those folks, they still encounter a lot of that, you know, starvation, disease, displacement, removal. And then when these churches come in and they pretend to be your friend and they offer you food and shelter and protection and all these things, you take it very seriously. And then you begin to become incorporated slowly into that socialized and um, adopted culture that they want you to have. Uh, so it's complicated, you know, these choices aren't easy and people make these choices for personal reasons and also for survival. It doesn't just have to be that part of the desperation of life or death, but could be financial, could be social, could be educational. It could be, uh, you know, market uh, economies that influence their decisions to affiliate themselves with one church over another. You know, these actually have real consequences into people's lives, but the things that really suffer at the hands of it are, you know, our culture, our language, our history, our traditions. And those are encouraged to be, you know, slowly wiped away while these other new things are encouraged to be adopted. Um, I just wanted to mention that just because, you know, it's not just about Native American or American Indian impacts. It's all of our indigenous brothers and sisters from all the way to the, the tip of, you know, the North Pole to the South. We, we've felt the impacts of colonization and uh, religious conversion, which go hand in hand. They support each other. Love it. Thank you. I think there is two, there is some numbers on that. Oh, John, I, this is Sheldon. I'm Please sorry. Sheldon. Yes. <laughs> um, that, and I've, I've seen estimates, conservative estimates around uh, 10, 10 million indigenous peoples, all the way up to 100 million indigenous peoples, with 95% of that, those being primarily uh, epidemics that are going across. I think the, the, a good narrative of this is DeSoto. He, he lands there on the banks of Mississippi and and he goes on this hike and he describes these cities that he's hitting just right after another in, in the Mississippi Valley. And these cities are bigger than any city that he's ever seen in Europe. You know, he's saying these are massive cities. And he comes back years later and, and they're devastated. Nobody lives in these cities anymore. They're, they're completely empty because of, of disease that was at, uh, the domestication of animals and the diseases that Europeans had because of that. They were they they ravaged these these communities actually um, of indigenous peoples that were in, in the Mississippi Valley. So I think there I did, I wanted to hook on to one other point really quick. If that's okay, please. please. Uh, and it's that notion of the his, history by and the and real consequences that Angelo talked about. And there are real consequences if you look at the history of, of America. And I think there's it's interesting studying federal Indian law. If you look at you you could put these timelines next to one another, you know. Uh, one of the very first cases that go up to the U.S. Supreme Court that have to do with Indians, uh, that usually starts the, the the Marshall Trilogy is what they call it, is Johnson v. McIntosh. It's an 1820 case, 20 years before the founding of the Mormon Church. Um, this case goes up, and it, this case is, it has significant impacts of, uh, of land holdings here in America. Um, and it's interesting, there's not an Indian in the case, actually. It's, it's an argument between two white guys of who has the, the correct title to the land. Um, one guy's tracing his title to a trade that he made with the local tribe in Illinois, and the other guy's uh, tracing his claim to the United States. And so could, could Indians give title uh, through a session is, is really the legal, one of the legal questions that is, is up there. And the answer, you get all this racist, this racist notion of the doctrine of discovery. That, that Indians are unable to hold land, you know, and, and, and all these notions that are, are talked about earlier before by, by, by some of our panelists, these ideas around manifest destiny uh, and, and Christianity justifies all the, all the negative things that, that come along with that manifest destiny because, because the, march, the march westward, the march, march for land, and of course you can see this in Africa, you can see this in the Americas, uh, you see this all throughout the, the world and, and of when others when colonizing forces interact with other, the other, quote unquote, the other, 
you know, there's this derogation, there's this appropriation, there's this assimilation tactic, tactics that they, they, they take. And you see it clearly with Mormonism, actually. I feel like I see it clearly with Mormonism. And when it doesn't work on the adults, uh, they start taking children. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about the Indian placement program. And, and eventually you can see history has taught us this time and time again, when, when all those things fell, it, it ultimately leads to genocide. Um, and, and when we, and especially when it comes to these ideas around truth, uh, existential truth, even, you know, like what's, where do you go when you die? You know, <laughs> I think there's a lot of people that have, there's, there's psychological anxiety around that. And if you disrupt that in somebody there, there, there's a lot at stake right there. You know, there's so much at stake and you could see that a lot with Mormonism, people that leave Mormonism, you know, like just that, how, how difficult it is to transition out. And so that there's some dynamics in that. I, I one last point too, cause I look at, so my, my father who converted to Mormonism, I, I think maybe in the seventies uh, or late sixties. Um, and I look at that generation of American Indians that, that converted and, and ex- were taught the Lamanite narrative, quote unquote, the Lamanite narrative. I, I, and you can see the similarities between this idea of liberation theology, because I think what the Cheyenne tradition, you know, he grew up traditionally Cheyenne. We have a cultural hero, you know, we have a religion. I know Sarah was talking about how missionaries were saying, hey, we didn't, we don't have any religions. Like we had a, our cultural hero, sweet medicine. You know, he taught us the way of life. He taught us our ceremonies. He taught us our, our government structure um, for Cheyennes. Um, so my dad had all this in place. And I think being, and Cheyennes, we actually, and a lot of tribes actually, we were very wealthy. We lived very wealthy lives um, and being placed on a reservation and, and seeing people st- die of hunger, you know, starvation and, and seeing that was devastating. I. I can imagine to our psyche, you know, like it was devastating to, to to see all these promises. And I think Mormonism offered that promise, you know. And I think my dad, my dad went to BYU, um, on part of the the BYU outreach to American Indians. Um, and I know a lot of American Indians. Actually, a lot of a lot of lawyers actually from that generation went to BYU for undergrad or law school. You know, like I, it's interesting. This whole generation of of older lawyers went were part of that because I think it was part of this liberation. You know, like here's here's a narrative. That you're going to be running things at the very end, you know. That your Lamanites are going to. I heard uh, Hiram mentioned that, you know, blossom as a rose. That promise, which is should be in place before the second coming of Jesus, you know, the, the, that 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 Indians we should be running things by the end of the end of the day. And I think that was something appealing to that generation. It, it's hard for me to speak exactly what my for my father, but I but I hear that a lot in a, in a lot of what older American Indians that converted to um, Mormonism. But, but there is that also idea, I'm going to throw another jargon idea, and there's uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, he talks about that notion of double consciousness, uh, of being able to operate in this world where uh, Mormonism sees American Indian, and being conscious of that, of how Mormonism sees us as American Indians, as, as, as lost people, as fallen people, uh, with he- heathenistic cultures, with savage cultures, you know, and so being cognizant of that and being able to operate around that. And I, I think a lot of people, like people that are exiting out of Mormonism, I, I think you could see a lot of communities that have been affected by, um, I, you could see the LGBTQ community, you know, the, the, the high rates of suicide and being awake to that, you know, like, and, and, I, and we could empathize around that of how Mormonism is both, the, the colonizing effect of Mormonism has affected both of our communities in very similar ways. Uh, of course, there's nuance, but very similar ways of, of how it's affected in our psyche, uh, of how we see see ourselves when we look in the mirror, what we look at when we look at our skin, you know, so it, it's a significant thing. So I just wanted to add that in there. I, I appreciate you. Let me jump in. Love it. Thank you, Sheldon. Hey, John, I, I did. I grew up in that that generation as well, where we were, you know, we'd go to the Lamanite generation every year at BYU, and, and we, we were very proud to see our heritage up there. And you know, uh, every every Sunday they would they would talk about you know the Lamanites blossoming as a rose. But what what does that mean, blossoming as a rose? I I never was told what was what it truly meant. Um, we thought, okay, well George P. Lee, he was a uh, seventy from 1975 to 1989. I mean, he was he was one of the uh, general authorities. So thought, okay, there there it is. We are starting to blossom as a rose. Maybe that's that's it. We're going to start having some more leadership in the church. And so I, that's what, I, but we never understood. But every time I would, I would go to church, oh, you're a late night. You guys are going to be blossoming as a rose. What does that actually mean? Uh, one of the things that was written in the Book of Mormon that we haven't touched on is 
in the very front, it says the Book of Mormon was written to the Lamanites. And so I always felt, oh, this is my history. This is the book of my family. This is my, my, my historical book that I need to read and I need to pass on. And, and when we, I talk to my friends and family, I need to make sure that they're reading their history. And so the history was always, always different for me. But I, I, it's, until I could truly understand where I came from, it, it was always the narrative of the church that was that was telling me where I came from and telling me how, I, how I'm supposed to live. So um, when George P. Lee was, was uh, actually um, excommunicated, that really hurt my view on things because, okay, now we lost a general authority that was Navajo or that was Native American. Okay, now, now where do we go? And so that was, that was very tough on us. Um, one of the things that he said that um, it, when he was quoted uh, when, after being excommunicated was he said he talked about the church and he said that the, in the church, there's no room for righteous men and women, but there's plenty of room for those that love pride, arrogance, power, money, position, and exercising unrighteous dominion. He came from a, uh, his, his father was a medicine man in the, in the natural tradition. And he said when he was, before he became a Mormon, he believes that he, there was a real need for a spiritual rebirth and that actually he was more spiritual before he became a Mormon as a, as a Nav, Native uh, Native American uh, in, in his uh, traditional beliefs. But that one thing that when we talk about our traditions being lost, <laughs> that was really tough for me too, because I didn't really learn the traditions of, of the Native Americans. But when I would go down, I wasn't taught, uh, just a quick story, I was, I was in, a, in a prayer circle. And in this prayer circle, there's only men inside this in the Hogan that we were doing that. And I was only about 12 or 13, but so they, they passed me a, a sack of pollen, uh, corn pollen, and I put it in my hand because I was watching everybody else do it. So as I put it in my hand, I would look around and I didn't know what to do with that corn pollen. I would see people go up and look towards the east and say some words, and and I really truly didn't understand. So I looked to my my cousin who was sitting to the left of me, and I and I, I, I kind of shook my head and said, "Okay, what do I do with this?" And and because he was my cousin and he was teasing me, he said, "You know, just just lick it." And so I did. I actually just licked the pollen and, and swallowed it as the whole, the whole thing, everybody just started laughing at me because I, I didn't know what, my, what to do. And I was raised, I wasn't raised in that traditional traditional uh, way. And so uh, just something that I wanted to share is that, I, that we did, we've lost a lot of tradition because I was raised in this way. My mom wouldn't let us do the traditional beliefs. So she, would, she would say, no, we, get the, we have the priesthood, you got to do the Mormon way. You don't, you don't do this way. This is a lost way. This is this is not the right way of doing, uh, of, of praising God. And so, yeah, that shows we lost a lot. So, like I said, it was, a, I was very pride, had a lot of pride in the Lamanite generation going to that every year. And when they changed the name, I, I didn't understand. I couldn't understand. And why would you change a name when that's who we are? We were Lamanites. Why would they say that? If, I mean, they called us that in the, in the book of yet they changed it. They, they said, no, we're no longer Lamanites. You're something else. So it was, it, it was really tough for me. Very tough. Cam and Sheldon, thank you both for sharing again such personal stories. Uh, this is very uh, useful, uh, powerful. It's very um, emotional to to have you share such heartfelt uh, stories. Um, thank you.